Hi, and welcome to another episode of Facebook Live with Orvis. And um, today I've been asked to talk about Tom's favorite fall flies. So I am your host today, Tom Rosenbauer. I've been with Orvis for 42 and a half years. So I've seen some changes here. And um, I love to fly fish. I love to trout fish, I love to saltwater fish, I love to bass fish, I sometimes love to steelhead fish, <laughs> but uh, today we're going to talk about trout flies and um, Tom's favorite fall flies and I just arbitrarily picked eight uh, trout flies and um, you're going to disagree with me and there's going to be lots of what about, what about, what about, I don't want to hear your what abouts, this is my list. So we're going to talk about my list today. Your what about your whatabouts will probably work just fine, but these are my whatabouts. So anyway, um, without further ado, let's um, let's talk about fall trout fishing. So um, one of the things you're going to probably encounter are some uh, large aggressive fish. Brown trout and brook trout are um, not necessarily spawning yet, but they're moving around, they're shuffling around, they're moving up toward the headwaters, they're moving into areas where they're gonna spawn. So they're doing some migrations. In some cases, it's a short migration. In other cases, it can be miles and miles. Um, but they're, they're not gonna be feeding as much, but they're gonna be, they're gonna be aggressive, they're gonna be territorial, they wanna get stuff out of their way. They want, uh, when they're spawning, they, they don't want bait fish and crayfish and stuff stealing their eggs, so they start to get aggressive. So um, let's start with the biggest fly. Um, you want something big and obnoxious and some maybe bright, maybe not. Um, color, who knows? if color is important in streamers. But this is an um, articulated fly called uh, Lynch's Double D, down and dirty. And um, it's a favorite of many people here on the Orvis staff, particularly when there are large brown trout around. It works all season long, but it's a good, it's a good big streamer to throw in the fall if you know there's some large, aggressive brown trout around. Uh, it has a deer hair head, with it, but it's um, it's it's epoxied and it's slanted, so that when you pull this thing through the water, much like the old uh, Dahlberg diver, it dives and then it will will ride up a little bit with the deer hair head um, after you stop pulling on. So most people use this uh, with a sinking line or with a sink tip line, or uh, what we typically do it makes it a lot easier. Is you just take a uh, high density. Uh, super high density, uh, super fast sink rate um, poly leader, and we put it on the end of our floating line, so it makes a sink tip. You don't have to switch lines. You can just just put this um, uh, sinking poly leader on the end, and then you know, three to four feet of a heavy tip. It might be one x, might be two x. Uh, it could be as heavy as twenty pound. If you put it on with a loop knot, you don't need to worry about um, light tippets and you don't want light tippets when throwing something big like this. So that's the big obnoxious fly. Um, you can pick your own big obnoxious fly if you want. This is just one of my favorites, the down and dirty. Okay, <clears throat> I think when you're streamer fishing in the fall, you also want something, sometimes the fish won't um, eat that big streamer. They might chase it, but they won't take it. Um, sometimes, you know, when you're talking a little bit smaller fish, uh, they're, they're, this is just too much of a mouthful. So I think you need some sort of uh, conventional, more traditional streamer. And this one happens to be a conehead marabou muddler. So it makes a lot of disturbance in the water because of that deer hair collar, but it's got a heavy metal cone for the head, so it sinks pretty well. And you can fish this thing on a floating line if you want, or on a sinking sink tip. Depends on how deep the water is. You know, if the water is only two to three feet deep, or even four feet deep, you can probably get away with just using a floating line. If it's very deep or very fast, you might want to use a sink tip, full sink, or again, that, um, that uh, super fast sinking poly leader. So, um, this one happens to be yellow. I like yellow in the fall. Brown trout seem to respond to yellow really well, uh, and so do brook trout, but um, you might also try a black one, and you might also try a white one. So, um, but uh, yellow is yellow is one of my favorites in the fall. So I don't go anywhere without some sort of some sort of smaller, more traditional 
uh, yellow streamer that, that sinks very quickly. So that's the streamer game. My belief is if they're going to eat a streamer at all, they're going to eat almost any pattern. They're just out there looking for, looking for something to grab, a piece of meat. And yeah, maybe sometimes color makes a difference. I'm not so sure it does. But have a couple big, have a couple streamers. Have a big one. Have a you know a little bit smaller one. All right. So um, dry fly fishing. Dry fly fishing is is often not great in the fall, but you can hit the rare day when the dry fly fishing is spectacular. Um, Typically, well, not typically. Sometimes it's good on a kind of a calm, warm, uh, still day, and um, can also be good on a, a raw, rainy, or even snowy day because insects um, will often hatch when the light levels are low. So there's two things you're you're gonna most likely see on the water hatching in the fall. One is a midge. Um, midges are common in most trout streams. They're especially common in tailwaters and spring creeks, and um, midges hatch all year long. And uh, they can be quite abundant in the fall. And one of my favorite midge uh, dry imitations when the fish are either eating adult midges or emerging midges, midge pupae that are emerging at the surface, is a griffith gnat. I'll bring this a little closer so you can see the griffith gnat. Uh, fairly simple fly. It's uh, got peacock curl. Uh, and uh, palmered grizzly body, and then um, some people put a little uh, crystal flash for the tail. This one happens to have a crystal flash tail, so it looks like an emerging midge. Um, or the crystal flash could maybe imitate the wings of the adult midge. Anyway, Griffith gnat's a great fly. It also works for, you know, it'll work when there's small mayflies hatching. It's not an exact imitation, but I've caught lots of fish when uh, on Griffiths gnat when trout were eating small mayflies or even small caddis flies. So it's just a great generic fly and it's very good in the fall. That's one dry fly. <coughs> the second dry fly is an olive mayfly imitation. So you're, this one is a sp olive sparkle done size 18. Um, you are most likely regardless of where you fish. If you fish a lot in the fall, you're going to encounter some hatches of olive mayflies. They might be as big as a size 18. They could be as small as a 24 or a 26. There, there are a number of different species of little olive mayflies that hatch in the fall, and they can provide some um, terrific fishing. I'm about to head to the Missouri River, uh, for a little fishing, and um, I'm, I'm hoping uh, to encounter uh, hatches of these olive mayflies. It's, it's typically very good this time of year, and I'm hoping it happens. So, uh, But you, we see these little olives um, in our streams in Vermont. You see them on the Delaware in New York. You see them in Michigan. Um, you see them on the Farmington in Connecticut. You see them all over the place. So have some sort of Olive mayfly in a size 18, 20, 22, 24, if you dare. Um, sometimes they're pretty tiny. And um, whatever, whatever olive mayfly you pick, you might not like the sparkle done. This happens to be my favorite because it imitates both an adult and an emerger. Um, but there are lots of, um, lots of different uh, olive mayfly imitations, and they're all pretty good. This one just happens to be my favorite. And this, these are my, these are my flies. So these are my picks. So I get to pick the one I like best. <coughs> Excuse me, a little allergies today. I apologize. Then you need some nymphs. Nymph fishing is probably going to be your best friend in the fall. Um, it, it'll be consistently day in and day out your most productive way of fishing. And um, lots of nymphs will work in the fall. Generally, generally, you're going to want to be on the smaller side for your nymphs because there, there are a lot of midges out there. There are a lot of little mayflies, small caddis flies, um, and small crustaceans like sow bugs and scuds. Um, so um, I'm going to show you four nymphs that I would pick this time of year. The first one is called the killer bug, a very simple fly. It's basically yarn on a hook. Some people put a Put a wire rib on it, but it's basically a piece of yarn on a hook. 
and um, sometimes simple flies work fairly well. What happens in the fall is that in streams with a lot of aquatic vegetation, spring creeks and tailwaters, that vegetation starts to break up in the fall. And um, these, guys, these guys live in that vegetation <clears throat> and they either get dislodged or they die because they got no more habitat anymore. And there's a lot of them, there's a lot of them drifting in the, uh, in the water. And the trout jump on them, they love them. They're full of fat and protein. Um, they're very nutritious and the trout will eat them. So have some kind of scud or sow bug imitation. Um, might not be the killer bug. This happens to be my favorite because it's really easy to tie, really simple, sinks well, doesn't have a lot of flash. I'm, I don't always like a lot of flash on my nymphs, um, but the killer bug is a great fly. It's an old pattern. It's an old English pattern from I think the 1940s or the 1950s, developed by the same guy that developed the pheasant tail nymph, and you know how deadly the pheasant tail nymph is, which is one I forgot, but I forgot to include the pheasant tail nymph. Never go anywhere without a pheasant tail nymph, so maybe we'll have nine of them. Um, and then you're going to want some sort of small nymph to imitate those midge larvae and pupae and the small mayflies. Uh, one of the best, and again, a, a very, get that a little closer, a very generic bug is the zebra midge. Simple fly, a bead, some thread, and some wire. Um, sinks well, uh, looks like a lot of different stuff, and it's a great, it's a great generic nymph, you know, maybe fish a bigger nymph and then have this uh, zebra midge as your dropper, but it's, it gets good everywhere, it works everywhere in the country, and particularly in the fall, it's an excellent fly, so have some zebra midges with you. And then, then I'd want a couple of um, kind of generic mayfly imitations. And I would probably, I would probably have them smaller than the ones I'm going to show you here. I brought bigger ones today just because they'll show up a little bit better on camera. Um, so one of them is a hotspot pheasant tail. <clears throat> so I did actually include a pheasant tail. This is a uh, this is a jig fly. So um, when it rides along the bottom, you're much less likely to hang up. It's tied on a jig hook and it rides upside down. So much less likely to snag. It's barbless, so it's easy to get the, um, the hook out of the fish. And um, it combines combines really a hare's ear uh, nymph with a pheasant tail nymph, and then it has a little hot spot. You sometimes orange, sometimes purple, sometimes pink, whatever you know, yellow. Um, but that hot spot, see, the nymph has a little sparkle. The hot spot seems to to key fish in uh, on the fly. And um, it, it just works really well. So this is kind of a kind of a, a Euro nymphing or tight line nymphing fly, but you can use the uh, jig flies on on dry dropper or on with indicators um, or um, in a tight line Euro nymphing scenario. I use them. I use them all the time, always. It just works really well, and they snag less, so you lose fewer of them on the bottom. And then I would have one more, one more jig. Uh, one more jig fly because I really like jig flies. This one is called a uh, tongue head, tongue head quill. Oh, I forgot the name of it. Tongue tongue head quill or something like that. Tongue head jig quill. Uh, if you search on it, you'll find it. Um, it's it's similar to that hotspot pheasant tail, um, but it has a little bit skinnier body. Uh, some, some of the mayflies are skinnier. I'll, I'll show you both of these together. This is the um, hotspot pheasant tail, and this is the uh, tongue head jig quill. Sometimes a more slender body um, sinks a little quicker and is more effective. So I'd have two different, two different profiles of uh, mayfly nymphs. And um, so those are my, uh, those are my recommendations. I just invented a new word. Those are my recommendations for um, eight flies for trout in the fall that will work almost anywhere in North America and then in South America next spring, which is fall down there, work down there as well. So, um, you know, just about anywhere in the world these, these flies will work this time of year. Um, that's all I had to say, and uh, we'll see if we have any questions for Tom.
Um, Mike's asking your thoughts on pumpkin caddis on the bat and gill. Mike is asking my thoughts on pumpkin caddis on the bat and kill. So there's a big caddis fly. It's called the October caddis in other parts of the country. And um, it's, a, it's pretty common. It's, a, it's probably one of the biggest caddis flies ever, I've ever seen. It comes from uh, the stick caddis, the ones that crawl along the bottom and make their, make their uh, cases from sticks and stuff. Usually lives in slower water. Um, I have never ever seen a trout eat a pumpkin caddis, adult. Um, they probably do. It's certainly not something that I would run out and look for a hatch of. Um, I might throw a dry fly that looks like a pumpkin caddis if I was blind fishing with a nymph that you know looks like a, a big case caddis. But um, it's it's not a hatch. In my in my experience, it's, it's not a hatch. It, it, on the bat and kill that is of any consequence. I think they hatch at night. I'm not so sure that they don't hatch out of the water. Um, I know they're abundant. I get lots of them on the um, on the screens and in my house in the fall. I live on another little trout stream not too far from the bat and kill. Um, so they're around and it might pay to imitate them, but it's not. I, I'd go to one of these flies before I'd go to a October caddis imitation. Don't have any other questions? Let's give them a second. Wow. Uh, Ross is saying to come fish the Farmington. Uh, 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 yeah, okay, I'll come fish the Farmington, like, maybe tomorrow. <laughs> okay. All right. Do you want to see if they have any other questions? Yeah, let's wait a minute and okay. see if there are any other questions. Um, I can answer questions about anything. It doesn't have to be about flies. If anybody has any questions, is there anybody listening? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, out there. Maybe nobody's listening. Maybe, maybe this isn't being broadcast. That's that's very strange. Usually we have a lot of questions. Should I sing a song? <laughs> no, I shouldn't sing a song. <laughs> Would you recommend dry or wet flies during rain? Yes. <laughs> I would recommend dry flies if the fish are rising, and I would recommend wet flies if they're not. How's that? And I'd even recommend a wet fly if they're rising because they may be feeding down below. But um, in a rain, I wouldn't fish a dry fly if I don't see any rises. I'll tell you that. Um, and what is your favorite? Matt wants to know what your favorite fly to use is. <clears throat> I don't have a favorite fly. I don't have a favorite place to fish, and I don't have a favorite fly. I look in my box and, and figure it out when I get there. Um, ben is asking, why no monster articulated things like gallop streamers? Well, this, uh, I don't know about you, but this is pretty monster articulated. If you don't think that's not monster articulated, um, that's bigger than, than any of my tarpon flies. Uh, so uh, that's as big as I'm going to go. That's um, monster, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> How long is that? Like five and a half, six inches? Yeah, yeah I think so. Um, Ross is asking if you fish sculpins in the fall. I fish sculpins all the time. <laughs> fish eat sculpins all year long. Yeah, and this is probably a pretty good imitation of a sculpin, the smaller, the smaller fly. It's got that flat head. It's a little bit a little bit brighter than a sculpin, but you know, um, with bait fish, you really don't need to match the hatch. You don't need to have a fly that looks exactly like a sculpin. If the fish is gonna eat a sculpin, it's probably gonna eat nearly any anything else that looks interesting that gets in front of them. So I don't, I don't worry too much about exactly imitating sculpins. I have, I have some flies that do exactly imitate sculpins and they don't, in my experience, work any better than, you know, something do you ever fish two streamers? Yes, I do fish two streamers. Um, it can be fun. It's hard to cast, you know, two big streamers. Um, I'll typically not fish two streamers unless I'm fishing from a drift boat, just because um, I think you need to cover a lot of water with streamers anyways, and, and um, a little bit easier to cast them um, from a drift boat when you're standing up high and just kind of lobbing than when you're, when you're waiting. So yeah, and, and it's kind of a good idea to, um, this is kind of 
kind of seems at cross purposes, but um, what I would do is I would put the little streamer first. You know, most people will put the big streamer first and then tie a piece of tippet on there and, and put the little streamer behind it. Um, but it makes more sense to have the little streamer here <clears throat> and the big streamer so that it looks like a bigger fish chasing a smaller fish. Just looks a little, little bit more realistic. And um, yeah, it's, it's a bear to cast, but two streamers uh, can be fun. Um, you can get some pretty interesting reactions from the fish, even if you don't hook any. Uh, when they when they start chasing a pair of streamers, it can be pretty exciting. Um, and Greg was asking, and it was when you were talking about the articulated monster, did you say these would work well in the Farmington in Connecticut and Deerfield in Mass? I said they would work anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they will. There's lots of other flies that will work too, but these will work there. Yeah, these will work in the Farmington or the Deerfield. Yep. What a uh, weight rod for that D&D? &D? Um, I have cast a D&D &D with a rod as light as a four. I don't recommend it. Um, probably a six. Five, six, seven. Um, depending on how comfortable you are casting a big fly with a lighter rod. The key to fishing a big streamer like this is, is not to use a long tippet. Use a short, heavy tippet, like four feet or 20 pound. Uh, that'll make it cast easier in any rod. Um, but, uh, you know, depending on how comfortable you are with casting, I mean, a good caster could actually get this out with a three-weight rod. It's not, not fun and not pretty. Um, if you're a little bit, if you're a little bit less comfortable um, with your casting, then I'd go with a seven-weight rod because it's a big fly. It's bigger than a lot of saltwater flies. You could even fish it with an eight. Uh, eight's getting kind of overgun for most trout, but... Um, you know, people do it. Um, Dan just tuned in. Have you mentioned your go-to fall dries? Yes, Dan. Go back and and listen to this <laughs> after it's over. Uh, Ronnie's asking, what line and rod do you use for wet flies? R Ronnie is yes. asking, what rod and line do I use for wet flies? I use whatever rod and line um, I happen to be using. Um, might be a, a three or a four or a five. Uh, sometimes a six. I, just, I don't. I don't use it. I don't feel you need a special rod for um, fishing wet flies because I mean most people go back and forth between nymphs and dries and streamers all day long, just trying different things. And, and I don't want to carry a second rod just to fish a particular kind of fly. So no, just I use the same line leader, dip it for um, for at least for nymph fishing or wet fly fishing as I do for dry fly fishing. Streamers, you go to a Streamers, you go to a shorter, heavier leader, yes, but you know this stuff over here, the nymphs and the dries, would be the same. Um, Scott's asking, how effective are stone flies in the fall? How effective are stone flies in the fall? Well, f trout eat them. Um, I don't. You know, the, the stone flies, I, I don't think, are quite as active in the fall as the mayflies or the cat. You don't see many stone flies hatching in the fall. Um, so they're not as available to the trout. They're not moving around as much on the bottom. And um, I have a feeling that um, they, they might be just kind of staying, stoneflies might be just kind of staying out of the way in the fall. I'm sure they'll work. I'm sure they'll work. And I'm sure fish eat stonefly nymphs in the fall. But it, it wouldn't be in my top eight or ten flies. Uh, Hugh's asking, how would you fish for trout during the transitioning from summer to fall? How would I fish for trout during the transitioning between summer and fall? That's a good question. Um, and I don't really have an answer because the transition could be really abrupt. You could all of a sudden get, you could all of a sudden get um, cold, rainy weather, water levels go up, water temperature drops. In that case, you're probably going to want to fish streamers or some, some bigger nymphs. Or the transition could be really mild where you have you know, mild windless days and um, insect hatches. So the transition varies. It really varies depending on where you are. And I honestly, I wouldn't, um, I, I, I don't plan, I don't have a plan of attack in my mind, usually until I hit the river. I mean, I have an idea of what I'd like to fish and what I hope to see. Um, but, you know, sometimes you have to readjust when you get to the river and um, and you see the conditions, so. Steve's asking, can you explain how to effectively use a thermometer to determine hatches? 
how to use a thermometer to determine hatches. Uh, I don't know of any way of determining hatches. I honestly don't. It's like figuring out where to find hen of the woods mushrooms in the fall. I have no idea how to determine hatches. You go to the river and you hope to see them. Um, what a thermometer will tell you is that whether trout will be active or not, and whether insects will be a little bit more active or not, but to determine when a hatch is gonna happen with a thermometer, uh, I don't know how to do it. Never seen, never seen a good way of predicting hatches by thermometer. Um, you know, if you're, if you're below 45, 50 degrees, things are gonna be slow. The bugs aren't gonna be moving around that much or hatching and the trout are gonna be pretty logy in most streams. When you get between 50 and 65, um, trout are gonna be really active. So are the insects. When you get to 70, um, trout may, 70 Fahrenheit, trout may still feed, but you wanna stop fishing then because um, you can, um, trout uh, get really stressed at water temperatures over 70 degrees. So you just don't wanna fish for trout, even though they may be feeding. Uh, Ronnie is asking, streaking caddis, is it the best fly whatsoever? Streaking caddis is the best, the streaking caddis is absolutely the best fly <laughs> ever. I have no idea what the streaking caddis is, but if you think it's the best fly ever, then it is. Great. Um, and... I think that's the end of our questions. That's the end of our questions. I believe so. Oh, wow, I'm getting off. I'm getting off easy today. All right. Well, uh, thank you all for listening today, all ten of you. <laughs> um, <laughs> we'll we'll be doing this again soon, and uh, we're probably going to start a pretty um, pretty more uh, more regular uh, series of Facebook Live uh, casts or productions or whatever we call them. What do we call them, Joel? Facebook Lives, um, st starting next year in January. So, um, And we'll try to announce it ahead of time so that you can, you can plan. So uh, thanks, for, thanks for listening today, and um, see you soon.